Okay, guys, uh, nice break. Let's uh, continue. I don't think we'll need the same amount of time for the remaining part, but <coughs> what I was planning to do is now to show you how this concept of resilience can be adopted to uh, infrastructure networks. Many of the or the general concept that I was I, pre I, I presented can be nicely applied in you know kind of general conditions, but when we are talking about a network of pipes or um, um, electricity transport or network of roads, uh, different definition or adaptation of that definition or mathematical form is necessary, and that's exactly what uh, this particular part of the presentation will be addressing. So the idea is that our system is now represented as a set of different layers of infrastructure that are uh, interconnected in between. That corresponds pretty well to, you know, municipal type of infrastructure uh, and the links between, let's say, the water and other types of infrastructure. Uh, in the development of this mathematical representation, obviously it was required to bring the network theory into the picture and link to the previous idea of quantifying resilience through uh, the simulation of the system performance. So we have a situation like this. One example is the you know, city road network, uh, water supply network of pipes, power grid, and let's say information network of the nodes that are uh, <coughs> used for sharing the information. So the logical links exist you know, between the layers as well as the system within each layer is represented a set of nodes and edges that are kind of connecting the nodes. Uh, when you uh, kind of represent your system in this particular form, obviously the failure is defined in a different way. Uh, the failure will be, let's say, the uh, break of the connection between two nodes, or let's say a disappearance of the performance of one node. Um, in the water network, the nodes could be pumping stations and the edges could be pipes. The pipe can break or the pump station may lose power and therefore not function. And pending of how this failure occurs, that type of failure propagates through the network in various ways. Um, like, um, you know, lack of power that uh, part of Canada is experiencing now is affecting the um, information network, the mobile phones are not working, the cell towers are not transmitting. <coughs> <coughs> the water uh, is not available in the parts of the uh, towns and uh, this particular uh, this particular favor is not affecting too many of the roads but some other aspects like uh, uh, falling trees and others are blocking a uh, number of roads and that is a very complex situation today. This morning I was listening to the Canadian news. They mobilize even the military uh, to help clean up and bring all these essential kind of systems back to function as soon as, soon as possible. It was interesting that the failure of the uh, information network, in this case, especially the mobile phones and the uh, internet was uh, uh, was causing a lot of difficulties and they do have backups. You know, for example, they were talking about the batteries, and, but the batteries can last 48 hours and if you don't have electricity to recharge them, uh, you know, they lose it. So the situation is now such that they do not have information network because they don't have a power. And until the power is restored, this information network will not be functional. And information network is essential for the communication between, you know, different services and so on. So only the 911, which is in our case emergency, uh, is functioning. No other communication is possible. So, <coughs> okay, so this is a little bit of a <laughs> sidetrack discussion, but the networks uh, uh, represented as a multi-layer type of uh, a system 
nodes and edges are the main uh, elements of the system. And the third dimension of the mathematical dimension is actually the layer, the number of layers. Edges or links uh, uh, between the nodes are possible and exist within the layer. These are the kind of nodes and links within one layer or one subsystem. And inter-networks, these are the connections between different, between different layers. That type of representation of the physical system obviously is a little bit more complex for the application of the, uh, of the resilience uh, concept, and you will see how um, did we do that. I'll kind of walk you through that. There is a publication that's available, and you can find the details. <coughs> it's already published. Um, the, the first step is identify, identification of the dependence. <coughs> Sorry, guys, about that. Uh, dependence patterns. And as you can see, a number of dependencies are being identified and used in the formulation. The first one is node to node. Um, <coughs> this is basically how the failure of a particular node affects the failure of other nodes. Um, this can be like a, a failure of the transformer station in the power network and failure of the pump um, in the water network. Both are represented, representing nodes and the failure of one affects the failure of another one. So that's the one type of uh, dependence. Another type is node to edge dependence. And this one is uh, simply if the node, uh, like a pump and the pipe, if the pump fails, there is no way to put the water through the, uh, through the pipe. So that's another type of. Then we have a node edge to path dependence, and that's a <coughs> more complex type of uh, uh, interdependence where the particular path or the connection between multiple nodes through the multiple edges may be affected by the failure of one node or one, uh, one edge or one link. Then we have a, a even a little bit more uh, complex node edge cluster dependence where the cluster of nodes that kind of captures, uh, captures or describes the particular uh, uh, particular uh, system structure is affecting by the failure of one node or one edge within the within the cluster. So you see how, from the simpler uh, uh, simpler type of dependencies in the network systems, uh, we arrive at a much more complex, much more complex interrelationships or uh, interdependent structure. At, at the end, we have so-called the geographic dependence, um, which is nothing else than simply the, the, the location of the particular component of the system and how the location of that particular component uh, is affected by the disturbance. Usually, uh, the best way to illustrate this type of dependence is if you get the, uh, if the earthquake hits the area, uh, the whole area will be equally depend, you know, affected. So that's the geographic. So you, there are certain you know, boundaries, how far this impact will be feeling, and that's the, that's the area. Or if the water inundates a particular area, the whole area under the water will be you know, kind of equally affected or, or uh, uh, interruption will be occurring. So that's that geographic, uh, geographic dependence. It's related to you know, the elevation of the land, of the surface, it's related to the type of hazard and the interaction between the hazard and the, and the area. Okay, so that's the first step. So the first step is to go through these various infrastructure dependence patterns to find and replace, the, uh, kind of, you know, replace them in a mathematical form. And when we have these interdependence patterns, incorporate them in the, um, in the system description. That means basically in a mathematical representation of the system model. Now you realize that because we have different types of dependence, you know, six kinds of dependence, uh, uh, that with the multiple layers, 
uh, these types will be kind of combining and uh, you start to have a very large number of, uh, of dependence of different orders. If you're talking about only two layers, and the situation is probably the simplest because you have uh, interconnections within one layer, within another layer, and between these two. But when we have three or more layers, then you have a multiple combinations. You, 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 you may have uh, interactions between, you know, within one layer and another layer, and between this and this, and this and this. And so, so with the number of layers, uh, the number of uh, combinations is uh, ex I increasing, and the, obviously the <coughs> order of the impact is becoming uh, higher. So that's the, with the increased number of combinations, you have a, a more of dependencies being incorporated, and therefore uh, requires more detailed or more complex uh, calculation. But that's, that's all the kind of, you know, basics of, I mean, of what I'm talking about are really the basics of the network theory. And, and this theory is applied in various fields for, you know, very long period of time and functions. And here it's serving basically as the input in describing our system and giving us opportunity to use this system description in a mathematical form to simulate the performance of the system under the changing conditions. <coughs> And after we have that description of the system and the uh, interdependence uh, uh, captured, we need to now bring the dynamic character of the measure that I was talking about during, before the break. And this kind of dynamics, yeah, I call them infrastructure dynamics, but basically these are nothing else than the uh, um, uh, key features, temporal features, of that graph, of the performance and resilience graph we were talking about. So we have a number of different uh, uh, situations, the system performance uh, in a regular form, the period of time where the system is affected by uh, the disturbance and not functioning, uh, and the, or sorry, the period of time the system is affected and it's slowly kind of losing function, then the time when we don't have function and then the time uh, when the system recovers uh, recovers the function. So, so that helps us define all this kind of regions of dynamic uh, performance and times. This one is called the buffer time. Um, this one is called the male function time or non-functioning time. And this one is um, the kind of repair, repair time. And you can imagine in this temporal scheme, basically our curve uh, resilience curve looking as I was showing earlier today. <coughs> okay, so we have now the structure, the network structure, the interdependence of the network components, and we have a, a description of the infrastructure dynamics. So then this kind of provides us for the opportunity to apply the definition of resilience, and we didn't modify the definition majorly. It's based on what I presented earlier this morning, where this resilience is capturing the system's ability to resist hazards, absorb the impact, and recover to normal kind of operation. In <coughs> implementing this definition to the networks, um, we also needed to define a little bit better the, the, the adaptive capacity. Uh, adaptive capacity is something that determines the shape of that curve, impact curve, and we divided this into two different types of capacity. One is a reactive and one is proactive, and if you remember, I mentioned that you have opportunity to kind of act um, or modify the system before the disaster or disturbance happens. Or we can, you know, simply react to changing conditions and introduce the changes to the, uh, to the system in the form of either adaptation measures or, or different response actions. They all, uh, these two are obviously affecting the four R's that I was talking about. Robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, and rapidity. And uh, because of the specific nature of the networks, 
um, robustness and redundancy are kind of integrated together in a mathematical form. Remember the, re the redundancy was showing the slope of the loss of performance and the robustness was determining the minimum level of performance remaining in the system. Uh, when the network fails, when the node or edge fails, you have a failure immediately. So there is no slower <laughs> or faster, there is no slope of that. Bank. We only have, you know, the measure how deep or how much function you lose uh, within, the, within the network. So, so from four R's, we end up with three R's where the first one is kind of combining the robustness and, res and, and, and the redundancy. Uh, this is the similar graph that we were talking about, but now introducing, the, introducing these two different response actions and how they can be. Uh, this is the system performance graph in the units of the performance. And the full line represents the kind of system reaction with adaptation measures. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the dashed line um <coughs> That line, uh, so, so with the reactive, with the reactive uh, response kind of measures, and uh, this one is with the wired boat with the reactive. I made a mistake. Um, okay, so let's look at. We said that the area below the curve is representing the resilience, and it's determined by the adaptive capacity of the system. And now we are just dividing this area into two uh, kind of areas. This shaded area, um, this shaded area will be uh, uh, the remaining performance of the system. You know, the robustness level is the minimum uh, performance level. And this one will be the kind of reactive uh, or the resilience that's affected by the uh, measures that we introduce in response to. Um, obviously, the proactive measures will change this area because the proactive measures will move the robustness to kind of higher level and therefore this area will be larger, the resilience will be large. The reactive measures will kind of change the slope and basically change this area and therefore uh, there is a small uh, difference and it will help be helpful in, uh, uh, be helpful in the calculation. Of but the, the, the idea is completely the same except that we are now considering the set of nodes and links in different layers and the failure uh, is being observed through one of the failing patterns and the dependencies that are incorporated in describing, uh, describing the system. <coughs> uh, if we do not apply any uh, kind of uh, reactive <coughs> adaptation measures, the system performance will uh, uh, remain at that minimum level forever. Uh, the, the recovery requires additional resources and move from this line to this line will be with, uh, with the different measures. Uh, the, yes, now I see why did I do this twice is just to show that if we uh, kind of uh, add some reactive adaptation measures, we have ability to move the performance to a higher level and increase the resilience of the system. <coughs> so the same kind of idea, the area under the performance curve is considered to be resilience. We are just dividing now this area into two, uh, the, the kind of proactive uh, restoration capacity and the reactive or absorption uh, capacity. And that helps basically in the def mathematical definition and calculation of the, of the resilience. So uh, what we now need to do is basically to apply the same uh, uh, idea of integrating this area under. Um, and the integration will be done through the kind of network uh, description in mathematical form with all the uh, interdependencies that may, be, uh, that may be present. So first is the calculation of the robustness. Robustness is this uh, level or the uh, ability of system to withstand and continue functioning with minimum this level of performance. And that's basically now done in the network 
notation by finding out how many nodes and how many links or edges uh, uh, are non-functional compared to the total number of links and edges in the network. Um, this can be obviously uh, uh, integrated through different network layers. And this is for one uh, layer, and this is for the, whole, for the whole system. The second one is resourcefulness. Resourcefulness kind of the, the, the determines uh, uh, this recovery slope, uh, the capacity to identify, establish priorities, mobilize various resources to respond, and basically change uh, the slope of the recovery, of the recovery line. Again, this is being done by now taking into consideration the system performance, uh, system performance curve and doing the calculation between different, uh, uh, for each time step between the expected or the initial system performance and the performance under the changing conditions. So we are permanently comparing now the total number of nodes and edges functioning with all the interdependencies that are characteristic for the system to the number of nodes, edges uh, being affected by the disturbance or being taken out of the, of the function. So that ends up in a mathematical form for each layer and for all layers together in this form. And rapidity, the, the kind of third one, because I said that robustness is including also the, 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 re <coughs> the redundancy. Rapidity, you remember, is defined as the time um, that's required from the impact on the system on, uh, by the disturbance to the end of the process or recovery process when the system is performance is brought back is the capacity to meet kind of priorities, achieve the goals, you know, in a timely manner, and or their con you know, losses, uh, the avoid future, future disruptions. Uh, in the case, the rapidity is simply the function, of the, the function of the resources being implemented, and it's utilizing the value, uh, the value of the robustness, um, and, you know, how much of this space we can, or this area, we can add by moving the curve or by repairing the nodes, edges that are being uh, taken out of performance. <coughs> so, you see, it's, a li it, it's the same idea of integrating the area under the performance, but because we are doing that through the network, just the notation is... Uh, the notation is different to include the node, number of nodes and edges with the uh, uh, type of interconnections in the calculation. So uh, now when you have these measures being uh, calculated individually, we can come up with the total uh, resilience and the resilience will be uh, kind of adding them uh, together. This is done for each layer. This is the resilience of each layer, uh, like a water or resilience of transport or, or roads or electricity. And this is now the resilience for the total, uh, uh, total system where this is the particular uh, type of disruption that's occurring in the system. When you replace the values for rows, which are calculated in the previous slide, uh, you actually now basically have these integrals or the area uh, being introduced into the, uh, into the relationships. And um, adaptive uh, um, and reactive uh, restoration capacity can be kind of separately presented, basically this area and this area, and also they can be added together to give you the total, uh, the total resilience. So the implementation framework, this is the kind of flow diagram for the you know, computer program that's used. Um, it's very much, uh, or the code is very much dependent on the description of the you know, structure of your system. So the first step is to come up with this multi-layer infrastructure model. 
uh, to uh, define the dynamic mechanisms. In the model, you are describing the interconnections, how many layers you have, how many nodes, uh, how, what type of connections are between different layers and so on. So, so that's the outcome of the first step. The second step is the dynamic, basically the time, buffer time, the non-functional time, the restoration time. So these are the additional inputs into calculation. And then this uh, uh, kind of disaster scenario description, which is nothing else in this case than identifying which nodes and which links are being taken out of functioning uh, due, to the, due to the disasters. Um, so you need that as an explicit input into, uh, into the calculation, similar to what I was saying, like inundation. But instead of inundation depth, you will have now, if the network is inundated with so much water, these, this, and this node will not be functioning, this, this, and this edge will not be functioning. So you have to elaborate in this, the whole scenario, uh, which is changing your system description or system structure. Uh, then we come to the step of identifying the restoration uh, strategy and this is only to kind of help us do the integration on the two different areas under the performance curve. Um, we do this whole process for a single layer and then uh, you know for each combination of layers and at the end you actually can put everything together and get the total uh, uh, infrastructure system resilience. So, very similar process to the original idea, only the network description is being introduced to the uh, uh, interconnection uh, uh, patterns as well as the uh, time uh, for or the dynamics of the dynamic mechanism which are driving particular uh, particular uh, this, uh, the, the p particular lack of um, or in disaster or disturbance, uh, and then kind of idea of bringing the restoration strategy to divide the total area into two, uh, proactive and reactive, and uh, doing the calculation layer by layer, and then combining that into multi-layer system performance. Now, system resilience. So, so what is good about um, <coughs> this presentation and this way of calculating is that we can again, uh, very similar to what we were discussing in the morning, can show the resilience of different, uh, of different layers. We can, for example, capture only the, uh, the resilience of the water infrastructure, or we can show the resilience of the in information infrastructure. And <coughs> that can be captured, you know, by our resilience curve, or we can kind of combine them together and show the resilience of all the networks you know, and the interconnections in the network. We tested um, this um, kind of concept and formulation by creating a very small test problem. <coughs> it looks messy here, but basically we are talking about four layers in each layer uh, having a four spatial units or cells and within each of them uh, 16 street nodes, 54 street segments, 16 water network nodes, 16 water pipes, these are in blue. The net road nets are the, like these black nodes, <coughs> 36 power Network nodes, these are in red, and 16 transmission lines, these are gray and the red lines. Five information nodes, the green nodes, and eight information network uh, links or lines connecting, connecting the nodes. So they can be either the cell towers or they can be um, uh, the computer nodes for the internet and things like that. So this is representing like a four-layer problem or the network where the interconnections exist uh, between, within each layer and between different layers with the <coughs> idea presented in a mathematical form. Now we were able to do uh, the calculation and show what you see are the kind of resilience 
resilience curves. Um, multiple curves are produced for uh, multiple uh, strategies that we were testing. And I think that was the question that you guys, you asked, you know, how do you use that? For example, here we implemented five different restoration strategies. And say you can uh, kind of do uh, the, the hardening of the nodes before, or you can do uh, the, the replacement of the pipes or doubling the capacity of the pipes in order to prevent the future uh, damage or reduce uh, uh, reduce the, the the impact, and as you can see, we were able now to kind of analyze the resilience for each of them. So, like for the street network, for these different five strategies, we were able to see what is, uh, the the black one is without any kind of adaptation option, and you can see the introduction of adaptation options immediately increases the kind of resilience. Then you can see that in a power domain or water layer. Uh, and different layers, so if you look at the values, uh, the values are uh, differently, differently affected. The uh, <coughs> information, information resilience is very high and compared to, let's say, the water, uh, the water which is you know, much, much lower. And uh, again, we can kind of combine all these four layers into a kind of single, and you have the whole resilience of the. So, so the idea is that with the repeat, with the existing structure, the mathematical model of that system, you can introduce various disruptions, you can introduce various adaptation options, and you can repeat the calculation of resilience and use these. Uh, difference between the resilience curves is one indicator which adaptation option is more acceptable, more acceptable than, than other. That's uh, 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 all what I was planning to cover for today. Uh, the material that we cover today is in um, the, the, the kind of basic definition of resilience. I think I already mentioned this publication yesterday. Uh, the kind of switch and discussion of this uh, concept of moving from risk to resilience is in this uh, paper and the very detailed representation of the second part of the presentation today of the network theory introduction is in this paper. Um, uh, that's so all of them are available and if you guys are interested you can download them or I can provide you with the copies. Um, uh, also, be sure that I didn't list this in the resources I should have done. Uh, the, the, my website allows you to link to my lab, and the lab, you click on the research. <coughs> and then the lab is Facility for Intelligent Decision Support. When you are on that web page, you go to the products. And the products include the, the water resources research reports. We call them also blue books. They are having each uh, ISBN numbers. They are available directly for download from the website. They are basically technical documents of our research, what you cannot put easily into, uh, into a paper because of the limitations of the length. We actually document in these blue books. So you have all the computer programs, for example, data and everything else. So you will be able to find a blue book that um, describes both the basic uh, uh, calculation of the resilience in a kind of generic form of the uh, system model that I showed at the end of the first part this morning. And also you will find the blue book and the code um, for, the, for the calculation of the network. Um, uh, the, 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 the network calculation is done using the MATLAB and the code is in MATLAB. The, the generic uh, calculation of the resilience is done using the system dynamic software known as Vensim. And you can guys uh, get the student versions and you are probably familiar how you can get MATLAB and utilize this. But the reason we did them in a generic form is that you can actually then take that and maybe apply to your system uh, uh, the way how that fits your, uh, your problems and your problem domains. That's it.
Thank you, guys. <coughs> now the questions, comments. And Do I need to clarify something? I, I got a question, Professor. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. you, you've been talking about uh, resiliency in uh, different systems. But for example, if I have a water supply system, a reservoir that's responsible to supply water for a specific region, yeah. and let's imagine that this reservoir suffered the consequences of a drought, and the level of this reservoir went yeah. very down. So what was Let's imagine that what were the measures for this region, that the local uh, authorities they decided to uh, supply water for less people. Yeah. So can we still use the same methodology that you yeah. presented? Yeah. Because, for example, in this case, yeah. we changed the number of people. Yeah. What you okay? So you 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 have to adapt to your problem to um, you know this kind of network context here I'm mm -hmm. talking about, and. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, the relatively simple way of applying the concept uh, will be to show the part of the system, like, uh, you know, how is the SUBSP providing, you know, supply for the, uh, for the sub uh, will be that you have a, a reservoir as a node uh, then you have uh, uh, different demand points um, as nodes, and you may have uh, various ways and you know connections because I understand you have uh, multiple reservoirs, you have tunnels, you have transfers, and that will be just kind of complicating your 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 network, uh, and that will be the first step. So you come up with the network, and then you see what are the what are the layers. If you're only interested in hydrologic conditions, that will be uh, the kind of input into this particular node. And what you can do is then apply the whole kind of concept and calculate the resilience of the system for various inputs. And you will be having some kind of answer that will be uh, that will can you know kind of help them understand what they should be doing for different or how the resilience of the system will be affected by the different inputs okay because the reservoir now can be operated in one way or another you will have now the kind of multiple realizations of this node yeah <coughs> and you will have the multiple kind of inputs that may go into uh, these different nodes so the, the, the operations or the operation strategies should be basically represented by different nodes. Simply the level and the volume of water that's consequence of particular operation. So the, the, the key activity will be representing the system in network form. And then from that point on, you actually <laughs> go through the, through the same calculation as I did show here. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, like, um, for developing countries or like yeah. here in Brazil, we don't have this uh, kind of uh, detailed data about the network. So, uh, do you have some approach or some? Well, what do you mean you don't have the data? Well, like, if you have a network, you must have the capacity of the pipe. Uh, you have a location, the distance. The you must have that. Uh, any physical, but, any physical, any physical network. The, the the problem could be like maybe you know various uh, inputs or the I don't know are the operational strategies public? Like how is the sub SP operating the reservoirs? My understanding from Andre was that there is some issues between different states because you are transferring the water from one to another state, and how is this affecting and so on. So this type of information may be you know, maybe either kept or not made public. But the physical information about the network, I don't see. Uh, we, we don't have, yeah, like uh, we don't have the, the, the map or the information <laughs> about uh, like a... You don't have that information? No. There are some, some things in Brazil that they were not limited. So mm -hmm. what, what, what happened? Uh, people occupied some specific regions 
and they just connected these regions with some pipes without any, without doing any type of design. Uh -huh. So, but, but do you know? What kind of pipe is in the ground? Do you know what is the sometimes diameter? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you don't. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, it's an often common. In my hometown, we, we, we only have the, the data uh, of the pipes that were, were built after some time. Some time. Uh, uh, before that, we don't have any data <laughs> about. Yeah, okay, that's a, you know, that's a relatively complex problem that I don't think you can easily you e easily modify it because that describes your system. You don't have a full description of your system. That's, you know, the, the, the issue. I don't know how you can help yourself with that. Um, the, the, possibilities, the possibilities exist in a uh, um, kind of, you, you, you can perform the calculations and simulations with changing two things. One is changing the kind of inputs and adaptation. Adaptation is also input, yeah, into this. And another one is changing the structure. So uh, the, the possibility for the situation like this will be, okay, let's represent the structure since 1950 or 1960 that you know. Um, and then, you know, you modify the structure kind of create a set of scenarios that, okay, if you have 10% more capacity or if you have 20% more, you have another structure. That's all what, you know, you can do. I, because without the physical information about the system, you don't know how the system, you know, can perform. Um, I heard the stories about UK where they discovered some very old wooden pipes in the ground. They didn't even realize that after 200 years these pipes are still carrying the water. Uh, but they do have the measurements of the flow, at the entrance and the, the exit, so they, they actually know what's going through the system. They may not know exactly is you know what and what how many pipes are carrying that but without this basic information you cannot analyze the performance of the system you have to bring that information in i'm not helping but that's about <laughs> Um, yeah, our, the problem we have the problem we have in canada and i'm going to show you the the example of toronto is that cities are very uh, very hesitant to share that information they do have all the information but they're very hesitant to share because they are afraid of the liability and the potential impacts uh, uh, they may have on the public or um, if anything happens with the system that it's not functioning properly, you know, the people immediately blame them and they are very, very hesitant. When we were doing this work, um, uh, uh, I worked with the city of Toronto and we tried to collect all the information and got all the information except the water network. They simply didn't want to give the uh, water network at, 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 at all. And uh, what we were, I'll show you, what we were able to do is, you know, to use some of the public domain uh, databases. Yeah, that could be the, that could be the possible solution. Um, now, um, the, the web offers, uh, I, have to, I have to dig out the address, the public domain infrastructure data. And it's being, uh, uh, it's being created by various inputs of individuals, organizations, remotely sensed data and everything else. So for the city of Toronto, for example, we didn't have the digital elevation model they are using, but we found from the public website, you know, the information. We found also the information about the location of the buildings and so on. But this, it's called open source. Uh, it, but these particular databases are not verified. So, so you have to, if you, if you collect some of the information through that source, which may provide you with information that you don't have, you have to kind of go into some verification in order to be sure that this information is, uh, is useful. But more and more information is coming in that form because the, either people or organizations are trying to contribute. So, so this open source is growing extremely fast for many places around the world. I forgot. I, I'll find out the address and I'll uh, give you the address so you can actually check what we did use that uh, for the part of the Toronto database. Okay. 
Okay, guys, then. Okay, uh, the group from Federal University of Campina Grande, they said that they, ha they don't have any questions for a okay. while, okay. but they enjoyed a lot your presentation. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think we can conclude this first part of your presentation. And in the afternoon, we will be back at 2 o'clock with our workshop with experts from different institutions and also Professor Slobodan will be here. Okay? So thank you very much. We continue in the afternoon.